Hi, Pete. How are you? Welcome to week eight. Good afternoon, Don. Um, thanks for being here today. Yep. And uh, we're going to do the last session uh, for Itch Your Money and uh, from the eight-week series. And I find this particular session the most interesting because um, it kind of talks about the mind and, and how smart people are very scammed, just like we all can be, and how much the mind sometimes is our biggest enemy. So um, let's, uh, the program it's called, can you put up the slide down on the? Yep, let me do that. So here we go, and there, and we're going to, I'm gonna hide this guy. And I'm going to turn this guy on. So and this is called the big takeaway, money in your mind. And Megan Kuhlbaugh, who has a master's degree and is a CFP, uh, is the one that put this program together. But due to some copyright issues and uh, technical issues, um, she couldn't be here today, although she, we tried twice before. So this is our third time, and we're hoping that this is the charm. Uh, so let's go to her ask first form like we do on all of them. Can yeah, scroll down just a little bit. Um, uh, Megan has a master's or other advanced degree and uh, she- it, Incidentally, she has it in education, which I think is extremely important in working with clients. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. a lot of times if all you understand is the numbers, you aren't real good with a person, but education would be a great one to have as a background. Yeah. Yeah, and she's um, uh, uh, has her certified financial planning uh, designation, and and the CFP at one particular point in time was an open book test and very simple to achieve. Uh, no longer today, she's had to pass a six hour exam, uh, had to be under uh, the tutelage of a, uh, a veteran um, uh, financial advisor. Um, it has a lot more meaning today than it did before. Uh, she's in the business uh, for, I believe, eight years. Yes. And, huh? Yes, Ten? that's correct. No, I think it was eight. Okay. And, um, and she, her firm is called Oak Street uh, Advisory Service. They have approximately uh, 50 clients. And I uh, believe they have between 50 and $60 million under management. Yes. Uh, and so there's three people in the firm. Uh, as you can see from relevant licenses, she doesn't have any. She is registered. Her firm is registered as a registered investment advisor, which is a registration, not so much as a license. Although on the FINRA website, it's, it shows as a series 63. Um, but the good news there is she doesn't sell anything but her services. She does not practice law and the business relationship. She's a fee only fiduciary with all of her clients. So she puts the client's interest first before her own. Uh, the way she's paid is by assets under management, sometimes shortened out by AUM, um, and her fee is 1%. She does not have a minimum, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, the, the lower your asset value is, sometimes the, your options are more limited and the more time and education that it takes. So the fact that she, she has no minimum, minimum, I think is absolutely wonderful. And she will um, also spend time with a potential, you know, if someone wants to come in and say, gee, let's talk and see if it makes sense, no charge for that. And she'll certainly spend time with people without charging them until it's, yep, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, so if you want a second review, it's always available, never a charge, never an obligation. She's not associated with anyone who, uh, is on commission and she doesn't take referral fees and she doesn't give referral fees. Uh, just full disclosure, um, I'm one of her clients and have been for approximately five years and she keeps me on the straight and narrow and uh, I love it because I don't have to think about it and have total trust in her. Her business 
is Oak Street Advisory, and that's her address, phone number. And she didn't put her email address on there, but I'm sure you can find it on the it's, internet. It's at the bottom. It's on the last slide of the presentation. Okay, great. Okay. Right there. Um, Off we go. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Um, behavioral what, finance. One of the key issues that we face is people, as you mentioned at the beginning, our minds. We are two and a half times more likely to be pained, if you will, by the joy of gain. And that's one of the things that's interesting when we talk about are you successful or are you failing? I was thinking about it and thought, well, if you fail, it's you're being humbled if you admit that. But if you had talk about your gains, you're bragging. And I think that sort of goes to the you hate losses and it's a lot more than you like gains. So Yeah, I, I was thinking about the, uh, uh, well, I have a friend of mine who is a close to being a professional gambler. <laughs> and, uh, um, and whenever we have a conversation, he very rarely talks about his gains. He always talks about his lose, his losses, and it and, and whenever he talks about them, it, it almost seems like it just happened, like ten minutes ago. <laughs> it could be two years ago that he had the loss. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so uh, and uh, there, there's also I've listened to um, a program podcast called Freakonomics. And they were talking about this phenomenon as well, how a negative is, is, is uh, so much greater in our mind than a gain or a positive. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 you can't help it. It's a part of our reptilian brain and we can get to that in a little bit. But yep. one other thing we just, because you and I got an email this morning regarding fidelity. What did Fidelity, what did, what did it show? Basically 30% of anyone who's 65 or over is taking, taking out their money out of equity now. Yeah, because of that pain of that loss. Right. So, uh, uh, and we just will do anything to avoid the loss. If yep. you want to read more about this, uh, uh, Richard Thaler, Amos uh, Tversky, Daniel Conaham, they're the literally the leaders in this area, and it, it's a it's a little difficult to read, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, it's um, it 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 gives you a whole different impression as to uh, how the mind works. And we're going to get into mo more parts of that in a minute. So, what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to start out with the report card. So how well does the average investor do if they're investing their money and their own advice to what they're doing? We'll talk about that. Why investors tend to fail. Academic research, so we'll come back into that one. Our mind in the media, which is fascinating to go through. And basically six takeaways. So the question becomes, if I was just investing on my own, how good would I be? So if you look at stocks, bonds, and a mixed portfolio, the average investor over the 20 years that this shows, and, and it ends in 16 because it's the last time they had, a, had information on the investor side of this as opposed to the market. So 4.79, 0.48, and the average, the overall mixed portfolio would be 2.6. However, if you just bought the index, remember it would have been- in, the, Remember the index is the, kind of like the S&P 500, the Russell 3000, okay? The index is, you don't have an active manager. And you don't think. You simply say, that's the index that I want, and that's what you have, and that's what it does. And you leave it alone, and you don't look at the newspaper on a daily basis and react to it. So there it was 7.68529, and a blended portfolio of 50-50 would have been 6.49. So therefore, <laughs> you would have lost a lot of money if you were trying to do this as an average investor. Are there people who do better than this? Sure. Are there indexes that are higher and lower? Sure. But on average, an investor would be losing money if they tried to do this themselves. So basically, given that Megan was an educator, we'd give them an F because they're failing badly and not able to beat the indexes along the way. It's a group that, they, just so in case anybody wants to go look at it, here's where the information comes from. So we're giving our sources. You know, it's kind of like the, when we did the uh, first session, session one, and we did the quiz, and we did those five questions from FINRA at the end of the, uh, of the test. 
Well, those five questions basically relates to financial literacy. And we as a nation are about 22nd in the world as far as being literate in the financial area, which is kind of why we have an investor grade of F. And this kind of uh, reinforces that, um, uh, that, that uh, research as that we're not really, we don't really do well. So going to that point, the dollars and cents as an example, for instance, if someone invested $500,000, yeah, there you go. Market return, let's say over the 20 years, that at an index level, the market return would be almost 2.2 million. If on the other hand, we were using the average investor for that time, they would have had 1,274,000. In other words, they would have lost $900,000, almost half the money, 900,000 over that 20 years by trying to be an, their own investment advisor and not working with someone or sticking with the index, as we said before. It's one of the reasons as well that your brokerage firms do not publish your performance on a regular basis. It, it, it's not easy to calculate your performance, uh, but you could see why they wouldn't. You might be concerned as to uh, comparing your performance to an index. Exactly, especially if they're being an active manager. Yeah, which we talked at about. Them. Yeah. So why are we hardwired to fail? Well, basically, oh. what's the evolution of our brain? We started out as chimps, you know, however you want to view evolution, um, and basically have advanced and advanced and advanced over 150 or so million years in terms of where we are. So where does that leave us today? Well, we have the old brain. Yeah, fast, automatic, basically. We're, we're back to your rep, reptilian brain that you talked yeah. about a minute ago. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, you know, Speaking of the number of years, the, the reptilian brain has like, uh, 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 since the beginning of time, <laughs> to develop. Right. Whereas the, uh, the fast-thinking brain, the frontal cortex. Um, which is next, which is next. Yeah, yeah, the, it, it's, it's like 10,000 years, which seems like a lot, but in period of time, it's not that long right so from a neurocortex standpoint this is the second part of the brain which is decision making and others really the reptilian brain was if you couldn't think fast you died if you couldn't react quickly you would die or starve or something that you would do where this is well let's think about it and talk about what we want tomorrow or something that isn't what our ancestors did way back when it was survive and react quickly or you die very yeah, but simple we haven't lost the reptilian no nope. We no. still have it, and 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 using the frontal cortex is 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 not easy. It takes effort. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, here we go with the brain game. Okay, Pete. So when I put them up, you've got to say what react, what okay. emotion do you see? Okay, anger, happiness, surprise, sad. I have no clue. <laughs> 408. Because <laughs> I'm a bean counter. Basically, what we come down to is we have intu intuition, we have reasoning. So in the system, one side, if you will, a reptilian is fast, parallel, automatic, just da, 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 fast money, which we'll come back to in a little bit. Um, on the reasoning side, you know, let's, let's take a, let's step back a minute, think about this control it, manage it. But that's been very, I mean, as we said, if it was 150 million years, 10 million of that is system two. We're still working on it in terms of what's going on and how we're developing it. But basically that's where we are. Yeah, and, and it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's just the, uh, uh, the system two is just, it, it is, requires some thought. Um, we're gonna talk about people who get scammed and, and it's usually, uh, because they're not taking an extra period of time to really think it through. Yeah. Re reacting um, um, emotionally through system one. 
So then you come down to what is modern research? Well, modern research says modern well, economics. Mar I'm sorry, mar modern yeah. economics is our basic supply and demand curve. Here's where they are at equilibrium. That's where everything's going to be balanced and all nice, except it assumes a couple of things. We're rational and we're capable of making decisions. And those aren't always the case because we can wind up in this kind of a situation where, you know, I, I just really have to question what this one, mm, yes, anyway. Um, it, no, I'm not one of those people. That's why I'm an accountant. I don't do that. And this one, let's go ahead and pee on the electrical high voltage and see if it lights us up. So basically the question became capable and rational. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, in the workshop series, I asked the audience as to whether or not they think their spouse is rational with money. <laughs> and almost, gosh, 98% of the individuals uh, do not believe that the spouse is rational. And so uh, um, it's... Uh, it's kind of like it's a it, tough it's a, world out there. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a concern. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do? But, by the way, it does not mean that the supply and demand theory is out the window. I mean, no. it's still really valid. Right. And uh, it's just that uh, our emotions uh, uh, take over, and and it's through this little amygdala. So we're learning through the through experience and processes and stored memory. But remember, this is this is a really really small spot in the brain that we're talking about here, as opposed to all of the brain around it. So this is an interesting challenge in terms of where we go. But then you run into this. But before we get into this, you know, the uh, um, if I talk to someone about investing in the stock market and they're old enough to have experienced the, the, the depression there is no way uh they will invest in the stock market not because of any rational reason but because of the emotions that 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 they lost maybe their entire uh, life earnings at the time and so it it our emotions that we don't really have control over because they're emotions. Uh, these memories are stored and they affect future behavior. It's interesting you say it because I was thinking as we went through this that uh, one of my brother-in-laws made a comment one time that his parents never bought a home. They always rented because you never know when the market's going to go down and therefore you always rent. On the other hand, when he was paying cash for a house because he was at the other extreme of let's make sure you have no debt. He couldn't ever tell his parents how much he paid for the house because they would have been mortified by how much money he spent. But that was the depression. Some of that wore off on him that everything he had to do was cash was then buying the house, but couldn't tell his parents. Yeah. And that's why, you know, um, uh, in the financial world, we don't really listen to or um, it's not in the news of research-based evidence type of uh, financial uh, uh, research. I mean, uh, it just we're 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 so involved in the sales aspect that doesn't try to go to evidence-based. It tries to attach emotions to it. Right. So let's go on. Okay. Because we're sure. both amateur in this. <laughs> so clearly here you have ups and downs in markets and, and forget what the time frame is at the bottom. This happens on a, on a more of a basis that we'd really like to admit. But you start out, you're optimistic and you're excited and thrilled and everything's going up. And then all of a sudden it starts going down and you become more and more upset and you become despondent at the bottom. Now remember, you're two and a half times as likely to be fear loss than to have gain. And therefore, oh my God, what did I do wrong? I'm going to sell. And that's what Pete was mentioning a few minutes ago in terms of 30% of people who are 65 or older are unloading their portfolios right now. And then you would ask, is that the best time? Well, time window, other things, or fear. And that's where you are. Then you start coming back up. And while you're depressed and here's what's happening, the risk of this becomes 
where is it? Come on, there it is. You wind up in this kind of a loop. You have this cyclical nature. At the high part of a market, you buy. At the low side, you sell. And then you repeat. The, the old argument of, if you want to make a million dollars in the stock market, start out with five million. And if you do this, then you will wind up with one. Because every time it's high, you're buying. At the low, you're selling it off. And you're not going to make money in this thing as you go along. Yeah, no, it's, and it's also, you know, there, it's also ties right into the business cycle. Um, you know, I, I was talking to a, a general contractor and he said, you know, when times are really good, um, money flows easily from loans, et cetera. And uh, because times are good, uh, then when the market goes down, you know, he says, you can't get a loan. And if right now, even though the mortgage rates are, are, are quite low, um, uh, lenders are very scared about lending out money. Yeah, one of the problems is when you really need a loan, it's frequently very difficult to get a loan because you aren't very dependable in their mind because you need yeah. a loan. Well, wait a minute, but that's what a loan's for. But that's sort of the, and you know, here's the cycle and here's where we're going. Yeah. So I threw this in. This is not one of Megan's charts, but I looked at it because I was thinking about a, a email that I had gotten from Merrill Lynch the other day. So now we're on a sales side of this thing. And here's this weird little cycle process going on that back in March of 09, the S&P 500 was 676. We're down here with all these crises going on. We had the Greek crisis, all these other things. Happened. Interesting that these crises are occurring, but the market was going up all through that time. As of February 19th of this year, it was 3,386. Unemployment we, was at its lowest. The virus wasn't anywhere in the news. No. Um, no. You know, uh, uh, there was talk about new highs in the, um, in the equity market. People were putting money in like crazy. So then what happens? We start into March. We have a liquidity crisis. We have all these other things. And what cracked me up with this thing was we have these segments that they've done. So in section one, we start having coronavirus and social distancing and volatile markets and all these other things. Okay. So then we plummeted. And I looked at this line at first and thought, it's almost going backwards, but that's backwards in time. And it's, they're showing it as a dead drop. Then as of, so a month later from February 19th to March 23rd, the S&P 500 was 2,236, seven. So sorry. that kind of backs up uh, Fidelity's comment that they see that uh, uh, a huge number of those individuals who are 65 and older are uh, cashing out of the market. Right. So then, according to this marketing piece, I will call it, now all of a sudden we're supposed to be in phase two, and here's what all's going on. Equity markets are bottomed out. Um, I love this synchronized global policy response. What does that mean? I don't think anything's been synchronized anywhere, <laughs> anything. And okay. And incidentally, as of when well, this was being recorded, as of June 19th, because that was last weekend, uh, the S&P 500 was at 3,098. Then you wind up into these interesting little segments of time, but yet this isn't time synced correctly. This isn't, and I'm going, what does all these pieces mean? other than it's sales. And that's the thing of, here's the fear, oh my gosh, you're gonna be in trouble, but oh look, the world is now becoming better, therefore we should all be getting back to these things. And, and by the way, Merrill Lynch has no handle on the future. They could put stuff out like this, but their guess is just as good as yours. Uh, who knows how long this is going to last? And uh, you know, you, you, nobody knows. And this is all just marketing. Well, and the other point, even to the marketing point, and if someone comes and says, this is the answer to all your problems, but you've never met them before, I don't know how they would do that because they have no idea what your condition is or your situation. And so this comes out and I looked at it and went, wow, I wonder what I do with this piece of information <laughs> in terms of looking at it. But they don't, you know, any pundit that you have out there who doesn't know you can't tell you give you good advice because they don't know your situation. And that's a lot of what we'll talk about in a few minutes as we go through this. Yeah. Okay. Behavioral economics is a big thing now. What's the psychology of it? And we're back to, uh, you know, what's, when do we react to things? Our 150 million years. 
150,000 years. I was a little too high there. Um, and so where are we going and what all's happening? And it's interesting when you look at it because then we face things like, okay, what's our behavior and what do we see over here? What do we hear of the various news broadcasts and other items going on? And how does all of that react to us in terms of where we want to go? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's it, notice that none of this is research-based or evidence-based uh, facts. Um, should we look at the media for our we, uh, news? We, we will, yeah, right. We'll look at that one in just a minute. So then the question is, what are your mistakes? What are the oops? And one of the things that comes up is basically as, as people, we can handle about seven variables at any given time. Think this of is your telephone number. Yeah, or think of your license plate. Um, Cause your telephone number has more than seven digits in it. That's the uh, area well, code, I'm sorry. Two. Minus well, three, minus whatever, plus, plus or minus. Plus or minus two. Yeah, that's, that's, why why you do, it up. <laughs> that's, that's why you push number three to get to the numbers you always want because you pre-dialed <laughs> it because you can't remember that many digits. But yeah. if you look at a chart like this of, yeah, what am I going to do with it? Well, the question becomes confirmation bias. Well, I think this is what's going to happen. Look, on this chart, I can probably find something that proves my point. Or recency of, well, just recently this is what's happened, but what's the long term going to be? Pete's favorite is hurting. Yes, we all want to be part of the crowd. You know, uh, it's kind of like, um, uh, I'd love to know what other people are thinking just so I can understand what, where the herd is going. It's kind of like um, the old adage of uh, buy low, sell high. Yes. Well, when you buy low, that means everything that you're reading is negative right that the herd is going the opposite direction of what you are where you want to go and so then what do you think the prospect is and therefore you got prospect theory yeah you know and 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 recency bias you know it's it's what's ever happened you know uh, one or two years ago or whatever sticks out in your mind right yep and Didn't i you... love confirmation bias oh yeah right you know, I mean, I'm even subject, I mean, I, I tend to go and read things that will reinforce what I already believe. And then you start reading things. And so this was out of, of Yahoo Finance. And this is on one day. She, um, Megan had typed this in. And these were the top three items that particular time. Now, the first one says stocks are edging higher. And that's from Associated Press. The next one says they're edging lower, and that's also Associated Press. And then Fox News said they changed a little. Now, all three of those were three days old, so they're all occurring at the same time. But yet, even with the Associated Press, you got two different, what do those words mean? And what's happening in terms of what's going on? And all of them were based on earnings. So what earnings were they looking at that they differ from each other? Yeah, it's, um, and <laughs> It's, uh, it's very difficult to get good information from the media, any media, especially, I mean, I just read the other day that 50% of the public now gets most of their news from Facebook. <laughs> and yeah, Facebook well. <laughs> has literally come out and said, we do not do any research whatsoever. Whatever somebody submits, we put in... Uh, we put in on Facebook, and yet it's the number, almost up there, number one as a resource. It's mind-boggling. So then the question is, what you read is what you think. So um, heuristics, so I want you to read this thing quickly. Obviously, Pete's been through this before, so he knows what the answer is. But if you read it, you say, New York in the spring. Yeah, I Except still. There are two does. I still don't see the double <laughs> Because it's easy not to, you just read through it. And yeah. oh, yeah, that's fine, whatever, that doesn't even exist to you. And as you say, you can do this over and over and you're probably gonna run into exactly the same thing. But that's part of what are you looking at and what do you see? And then you have, as we were just saying, your mind and your media and where all do you wanna look in terms of what all's going on. So we were curious, Megan had gone through and with Fox News and CNN, what is their philosophy and what are they doing? So if you dig deep enough somewhere, you can find their mission statements. 
So here's CNN's vision statement and Fox News vision statement. And I highlight for you a couple of lines that I found interesting. So on our mission for CNN, our mission is to create the finest possible news product and present heartbreaking national news. And CNN, we know our news and want to share it. Mm, okay. Now, Fox News becomes in their mission statement, Fox Nation, and it's created for, for people who believe in the United States of America, its ideals as expressed in the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and Emancipation Proclamation. And we're committed to the core principles of tolerance, open debate, civil discourse, fair and balanced coverage of news. I'm not sure exactly where sharing information and news fits into these two. They may be slightly different in their approach uh, when you watch them, but it's what is fair, what is reasonable, what is the product, what are we doing? And yeah, interesting, totally. Yeah. So sizzle sells, and that's the key of that part of it. So if you look at the experts and what they're doing, we have, there were several videos that had been in this original presentation and because of copyright, we had to take them out. So this happened to have gone along with an interview of Jim Cramer, who on the Today Show at this point in time, over here on the far left, had said, I don't care what you have in the market, take everything out. I don't care if you have losses, I don't care what you do, the market's going to go down and by God, you have to get in. You, you could consider having five years worth of money yeah, if you value your retirement, yes, you sell you, today. Yeah, and and you have to have taken out and have available to you five years worth of money. And I thought, I'm not sure there's a lot of people who would have that if you took everything out of the market. So Kramer was right; it went down slightly. But then over the next five years, if you had stayed out of the market, you would have lost on an 88 percent return on the S and P annualized at 17.6 percent. So. Yeah. Who's doing what and when and where and how is sort of what you look at of this is the expert. But again, they, he doesn't know you and any other pundit other than your, your uh, fiduciary advisor doesn't know you and what you're doing and where you're trying to get to. Market timing is a multi-billion dollar business. You know, so it's uh, MSNBC um, is famous for this. So what you get into is you've got over here, you've got investing over here is entertainment. I mean, somebody, somebody in listening to the various weeks we've gone through of, of it's your money. They continuously say you should never watch CNBC because it's just going to drive you nuts. And the comic part is I watch it every day, but I watch it for entertainment. I wouldn't consider investing from it. I just watch it for entertainment value. And I just really do it because I want to see what the stock markets are doing. And that's, I don't react to it. I don't buy or sell anything. I just view it as entertainment, not in the middle of this overlap, which is a bad idea. Yeah, MSNBC is one big info commercial. Oh yeah, yeah. And so you got to understand is that uh, they're trying to appeal to their advertisers who support the program. Yep. You as a, as a TV viewer, they just need to have your eyes on that channel in order to sell the number of eyes to their um, advertisers for them to make money. Right. So it's uh, very rare when MSNBC has a professor on or a fee-only advisor on because investing is pretty boring. It's not entertaining. Right, yes, <laughs> yeah. Watching a turtle go around a track, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> Tortoise yeah. in the hair, yes. Yeah, it's just... Uh, it's we'll get to that in a moment in a couple minutes that's the that's the five-year uh government funds that we'll talk about in a couple minutes in terms of a return on investment so there's six takeaways that we're going to go through basically warren buffett saying you know it isn't your iq that does this if you've got an ordinary iq then you're fine it's really i think almost more the temperament of can you control your urges of all right let's unload it let's do something with it and really the key to all of this becomes where are you going to go with it? Well, what's the investment policy? And Megan and the other uh, fiduciary advisors that we've had on have all said, you got to have an investment policy. What yeah. do you want done? What do you want to invest in? What's your risk? What's your reward tolerance for those two? 
um, you know, where are you trying to go and why and how are we going to get you there? Rather than, oh my God, the market went down a hundred points, let's react. Yeah. And you need to write it down. And even if you do your own investing, you know, put down why you're investing the way you do so that in a time where you may panic, you've got something to go back to and read and, and hopefully get that frontal cortex to kick in and think about it and not make a quick um, emotional reaction. Right. And then get into, okay, what are the competing hypotheses? I mean, I have no qualms of, I'm talking to a financial advisor and they're going, well, you know, what about this or what about that? Okay, give me ideas and give me thoughts, but let's have a rational approach to what we're doing and where we're going. What if you go wrong? What's the downside risk of this? Then? In one yeah, of the, maybe, one of the sessions that we had had, somebody ask a question of how do you evaluate Tesla stock? And the next week I'd answer the question and said, you decide how much money you want to risk and you decide where you want to put it, but it isn't your life savings you're dealing with. And it isn't bad with Tesla. I mean, Tesla's an interesting company, but on the other hand, what are you doing? And if something went wrong, what would occur? And what do I not know? What's the unknown? And the answer, what's not known? Tomorrow <laughs> and beyond, but yeah. Nobody can predict your future. You know, um, the, the, Megan does a financial plan and doesn't charge anything extra for it for all her clients. And the reason for that is also for her to figure out, you know, what your risk tolerance is, what your cash flow is, what your net worth is, and to put those numbers on a sheet of paper or into a system so that you can do what ifs, entertain competing hypothesis. So if we have a 60-40 portfolio and we have a 30% drop in the market, what will my portfolio look like? And so you can then say, well, how do you feel about that? And, um, and if you don't feel good, uh, then you can go, okay, maybe 60-40 portfolio is not for you. And remember, the 60 number is the equity portion. The 40 is the bond or fixed income portion. So maybe a, a more stable portfolio would be better for you because you've already met your spending needs so that you have a 40, 60 portfolio. So that's what, you know, that's where the entertaining competing hypothesis comes in. And that's what we're going to be getting to in two slides. So the issue you face then is, where did this come from, Pete? I saw it in AARP. Yes, I was going to say, I know that header, that's ARP. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but, it, but I want to expand it a little bit because it's not just scammers. Uh, Doug Shadel has uh, done a lot of uh, research in this area and uh, university type research. Um, scamming takes about $31 billion uh, out of uh, innocent people's hands. So, uh, so let's look at some of the uh, tactics that they use. Phantom riches, uh, uh, you know, the lottery. Hey, you're going to win the big money, you know, so uh, you're going to get the big riches. Uh, of, course, of course, even worse probably in this one is you've already won but you yeah. have to send us the tax money and then yeah. we can release the money back to you. Oh, oh that yeah. ain't gonna be good. Yeah, the Phantom Riches don't talk about uh, compounding. They're talking yeah. about fear. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. uh, fear, it's one of the strongest drivers. Please understand that, which is good. Fear gives us the, the uh, kind of tap on the shoulder to say, let's look at this again. Fear is not bad. It's that if fear drives the decision, um, you know, hey, you're going to get audited or, you know, uh, remember the, um, God, what was it, Y2K? <laughs> that everything was going to fall apart uh, after the first of a year, you know? So fear is, fear also drives the news. I mean, uh, we don't like listening to good news all the time, but if, you know, something fearful is coming forward, we want to hear about it. Intimidation, ah, uh, it happens within families, it happens uh, 
uh, with uh, financial advisors. Uh, I see it a lot in annuities uh, sales. Um, so, but, you know, somebody tries to intimidate you, walk away. Right. Ah, scarcity. If you don't invest today, that opportunity is going to be lost. It's the only, it's the last opportunity that's ever going to yeah, exist. There, there's always going to be a better deal. <laughs> <laughs> Source credibility, you know, listening to CNN or listening to Fox News is not a credible source. Uh, you know, so you've got to read more uh, than or listen to more than one news. You got to you got to go a little bit further than that. Uh, commitment. We have an innate desire uh, to not disappoint another individual, and sometimes scammers use this commitment. They'll give you a freebie and say, hey, remember how good I was to you a little bit ago? So trust me now. Re 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 reciprocity. reciprocity. <laughs> yep, easy for you to say, yes. To say. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's kind of the, 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 the other side of the commitment too, is just that if you do something for you, it's naturally for you to return to favor. Be careful. These are very common emotional issues that, um, that scammers use. And also, I mean, um, our, you know, master's degree programs in business, when you have a, uh, a focus group on this is what they're going for. What emotional buttons will you, will you, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember whoever came up with the, uh, the term death taxes. <laughs> I mean, brilliant. You know, their death taxes are probably only, uh, even when they changed the law, it was less than one tenth of one percent had to look at death taxes. Last year, the uh, estate tax, I'll call it by its other name, there was approximately 1,900 estate tax returns submitted to the IRS for over the amount, which would have taxable return. Only 1,900 out of the entire United States, all estates that were processed, that's all that ever got into having to pay tax. And yet they referred to it on the flip side as Death tax. Yeah. Yes. Or the uh, there was a uh, uh, a banner being flown across the beach area here in Laguna Beach last weekend. Newsom, socialism. <laughs> oh yeah. I bet you that's could strike fear in somebody. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's amazing how particular words have uh, the, the emotional effect uh, without going into any more details. Right. Yeah. So takeaway two, what's the right mix? What do you want to have? And what's the need for, as Pete has said, you know, 80, 20, 60, 40, 50, 50, what is equity versus stock? And what do you have? And really what that comes down to is risk and return. What is your ability to take risk? Do you have enough money that if it goes down, you're going to be okay? Do you need to take risk because you need to earn more money to be able to live the way you would like to live, which case then you have to take a higher risk. And are you willing to do that in terms of where you're going and what's happening? Now, it, and it, why, go ahead. Why, why, why take the risk if you don't need to? Yes. But I think it's more important is, is that I, what I find is most individuals do not have an understanding of the risk that they're taking. Right. And so this chart kind of talks about that. And we had had questions when we were doing this thing live of, you can see emerging market stocks over here, small caps. Question is, where is large cap? Well, that really is the S&P 500 stocks are large and mid, mid caps are in between the two of them, between the S&P 500 and small caps. But again, from, from stock side, if you're in emerging markets, you've got a much higher risk and we'll see that in a minute. And if you go all the way back over here to bonds on the other side of it, to the blue side, then you're going to have a much lower return, but it 
it's going to be boring and just going to keep chunking away and not give you a very high risk. And the thing of it is, is that when we're looking at investments, the most the number one question that I get from attendees is, is this a good investment? I, I have no idea. And the reason for that is I don't know your ability to take risk, your need to take risk. Uh, I don't know what your entire portfolio looks like. Uh, emerging markets, uh, higher risk, does that mean that it's bad? No, it's not that it's bad, it's just that it's a high risk. Yep, so then you get to diversity, which is a key element, and that's looking across different sizes, different markets, different types, do you want to go bond? Do you want to go stock within those? How do you mix them? And diversification isn't having three stocks for three large cap companies and saying that you're diversified because you're across three of them. No, first of all, you shouldn't have the three stocks probably. You should probably be in funds or indexes or something else, but then diversifying across all of that. And where that becomes really critical is this eye chart, which is all of the categories over here on the left-hand side are the ones that are charted above but they scatter all over in terms of what returns are on them. The, the other part too is, 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 is that this is the vocabulary that's being used. So um, if you own a mutual fund, you need to understand what is that mutual fund investing in. So if, it's, uh, if your manager is investing in U.S. large cap stocks, you can't compare that manager to a international small cap value fund. And so all of these are objectives of different funds. And the color chart shows that in any one year, it's all over the place. So I was curious, being the bean counter that I am, of looking at these numbers across the bottom and going, what did those mean to me if I was doing investments? So I created my own eye chart for this thing. And basically the data that Megan happened to be using was from 2002 through 2016. I happened to pick large cap, small cap, emerging market, and five-year government fixed. So I said, if I started with 100,000 each year, what would happen as I went across? So if you started with 100, the way the historic list says, you'd wind up with $264,000 after uh, 14, 15 years, okay? Now, if you were small cap, it would have been 336, that 339,000. If you were in emerging markets, it'd be 390. If you were in government, five-year government, it'd be 153. But, so first question becomes, where do you need to try to get out here for a risk standpoint? But the other part of it, how well can you sleep? So that 100,000 in large cap dropped 21% in that year, so you lost $22,000. Would that bother you? Would that make you not sleep? What would happen? So then you go trudging along until you get out here to 2008, and it dropped $50,000 coming all the way across. Okay, small caps, it only went down $20,000. But when you got out here into 07 into 08, you lost 2,700, then 57,000. Again, you lost money out here in 15. So that's where you went across. This is the one that I thought fascinating. Emerging markets, you start out with 100,000, lost a little bit of money, but then within one, two, three, four, five, six years, it was up to $452,000. Well, that's a great thing. I'll invest in that. The next year it lost $241,000. Well, if it's losing $241,000 and it was at 452, are you sleeping at night? Because it went down 53.3%. And can you accept that? Incidentally, from that high of 452, it never recovered. It only got back up to 390. Now you can say, well, I'm a smart investor. I would have sold it at the end of seven. Really? After all those gains, you're going to decide it's going down. And then I jump in on the other side. Okay. Remember the average investor? Maybe you're not average, but that's a high risk situation. Okay, I can't tolerate this stuff. All right, five year government. So it only lost money and very little money out here in 2013, winds at $153,000. Just as a note, inflation, the average of 3% out there that many years would be 
$155,000, at which point then you haven't, with five-year government, you haven't even kept up with inflation. I do want to note, as they always do when they do these things, past performance does not represent the future. So don't say, oh, I'm going to get into emerging markets for five years. Yeah, but it's amazing that the highest risk or the two highest risk categories, small cap and emerging markets, you know, gave you pretty good returns. Yes. And For that uh, window of time. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so, and this is just this window of time. You know, who knows if you add another five years to it, but it shows you that at least that the equity portion of your portfolio usually beats inflation. Yes, yes, over a period of time, yes, absolutely. And the other part of it, and going back to the, what it was before, can you tolerate this much risk? And if you go, I can't, I, I, I couldn't sleep at night if I lost 20% of my money. Okay, then you better back off a large cap. But then again, that may be almost everywhere, although emerging market, well, no, that's bad year. Um, you know, that's where you need the fiduciary financial advisor who's going to say, good, this is the way we can put a portfolio together for you, recognizing your willingness to take risk, your need to take risk, and ability to take risk of whether or not you can sleep losing $241,000 in a year. Uh, yeah. But that's, so looking at emerging markets, there's the eye chart for emerging markets. And you look at any of these things and say, okay, the one I liked was, let's see, oh, she picked on it. So these shows where they're all over the place. This one takes Indonesia, which I thought interesting. It was the least in, in 97 and the highest in 2011, but it's scattered all over. So who are you going to pick? I'm mean, not picking on Indonesia, but it happened to be the opposite ends of this chart in terms of where they're going and what you start looking at. Yeah, it's impossible to predict uh, the future by anyone. A big part of looking at all of this is what's your fee? So when we this talk is, about, you know, so we're, now we're getting into what can you can control. You can't figure out, you know, what the future routine return is going to be on a portfolio, but you certainly can control fees. Yes. And fee, the issue is, okay, so if you started out, assume a six and a half percent return over these 30 years, you start out at a million dollars as you grow across. If you were at 3% fee, you would wind up with 28 million, 2.8 million, yes. If it's 2%, you'd be 900,000 higher at 3.7. And if you were to 1% fee, it's almost $5 million. That's one point each as they go up. And Pete made a comment last week when we were doing this, the change to your 401k, you can now have private equities in your 401k. Oh golly, because that's very high fee, very high risk, and you will Yes, you might make money if it goes, but statistically, if you look at these going one point, they'll have a six point if you're going into private investment, and that's tough. Yeah, it's, um, look at even at the 10-year mark, you know, I've had individuals look at this chart and they go, ah, I'm 70 or 80 years old, you know, I've, I've already... I've already uh, made my decision. It's not going to make that big a difference. Well, even at 10 years, look at that, how that fee, I don't know what the exact number would be, but uh, it makes a difference uh, over time. Absolutely. And, you know, so, uh, and we're living till 90s and into the hundreds. So uh, make it, understanding how much you're paying in fees is really, really important. And it's difficult to figure out if you have a brokerage account with Merrill Lynch, UBS, Morgan Stanley, you know, it's, it's not easy to figure out. So, yeah, yeah. but it's something that you need to know. Now, we talk a lot about not being an active investor, but there's a difference between that and rebalancing. So when you set up your account, if you say, I wanna be, let's use 60-40, I wanna be 60-40 or actually because of the next chart, I'm gonna say 50-50. Over time, one of those is gonna grow faster than the other. So you wind up with this kind of a situation where that's where I started at 50-50. But over time, bonds grew in this example. So now you have more of them within bonds and less as a percentage within stock. So rebalancing says, 
okay, sell some of the bonds, buy stock. Now, intuitively, wait, you want me to sell good things? That makes no sense. Well, yes, actually it does. Because remember, our plan was to be at 50-50. And unless the plan has changed, 60-40 doesn't work. Now, I raised the issue with Megan when we did this of if you're over, we're 70 and a half, and now the number goes to 72, you have required minimum distribution. Well, what if to do my required minimum distribution, the answer is sell bonds. That may be psychologically less painful to you than saying I'm gonna buy stocks which aren't doing as well. You need the cash out, therefore take it out of the heavy load. Yeah. And Peter Great. <laughs> what I was gonna say is, is that usually people do this at the end of the year as well. And also towards the end of the year, you need to do some tax loss harvesting. So if you have some losses in your portfolio, uh, offset it with some of the gains, and it's a, it's, it's a good way to rebalance and also increase your cost basis, uh, which that's what you want to do in your investable asset part of your portfolio. Yeah, outside of your retirement, I mean, you're outside of your RO. Yeah. R but, but, <laughs> but, but, but not doing anything is better than buying and selling. So, oh, yeah. yes, yes. You know, there was a um, Thaler, T H A L E R. He's the one on the original behavioral economics uh, finance side. They asked him uh, because he's at Chicago University and he's a professor there. And they asked him uh, um, how he invests his uh, 403B account that most professors and people at universities have. And, he's, uh, and he says, um, I have all of my monies in equities and I have it in a diversified portfolio through, uh, at the time he said TIAA, which was a university not-for-profit at the time. And he says, I never opened my statements. Think about it. Trust the plan. You know, never open his statements. Because when you, he was trying in behavioral economics, his behavior would have been, if I look at the statements and didn't like what I saw, I showed a loss or whatever, I will want to make a change. So in order to prevent him from making any changes from his original uh, portfolio, he didn't open his mail. And I, I thought that was really telling from someone who's very smart and has written a book on behavioral finance. So his behavior is avoid it. So I don't have yeah. a behavior. <laughs> yeah. Selecting a, an, an advisor. Clearly we will tell you it has to be a fiduciary advisor because otherwise relax. My broker tells me I'm, everything's going to bounce back, but I'm your broker um, is the risk that one can run into. So the key in this is, and we touched on it in fee, we've touched all through this over the eight weeks, is a fiduciary advisor is critical to you. Yes. And remember in the late 80s, there was uh, a real push for limited partnerships. And I, I still see limited partnerships in, in uh, people's portfolio. And most of them are completely uh, broke. And the people who sold them to you are no longer in the business. So... Selecting an advisor is, is really important when we encourage you to um, uh, take the ask first forms of the advisors that have been doing the presenting. And if you are a spouse that, um, uh, that your other spouse was doing the investing and your spouse is no longer with you and you're and you're all, all of a sudden on your own, for 1% per year, uh, getting an independent fee-only fiduciary advisors is one of the best moves that you can make. Um, and it assures you and uh, prevents you from doing something silly. And all it takes is in your retirement account, one time doing something really silly. And you are, you know, you're not going to go back to work. So, um, uh, so it's selecting your advisor is 
really important. Doesn't mean that you have to go out if you're doing it yourself today and you're comfortable and uh, 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 continue, but make sure that uh, whoever is the surviving spouse um, uh, has somebody who they can go to upon your death. But the other part of staying, if you decide I'm going to stay where I am, make sure that you're knowledgeable of what it's costing you. What are you getting for it and what are you paying for it? And making yeah. sure that that works for you. Yeah, and don't, don't hey, my, my husband had a broker for the last 20 years and he trusted him, therefore I'm going to trust him. And that broker will usually pass that portfolio on to an underling as well. Right. So, don't, it, you know, not a good reason to stay with a broker. So the issue then comes down to what can't I control and what can I control? We've talked about the hardwiring of the brain, media, marketing, timing. Um, it, it's difficult to do any of those kinds of things. And so it's what are your tendencies, the right mix, diversification, having a plan as we go through this, rebalancing to get it back in, in, in line with what the plan was, minimizing your taxes. Because one of the things we haven't talked through this was what is the tax implication? Because yes. Pete had made the comment a moment ago of tax loss harvesting is a great idea as long as it's a taxable account. And because remember, now, yeah, you but, can have seven for a, for a married couple, you can have $77,000 worth of long-term capital gains and pay zero amount in taxes on that yeah. amount. It's just amazing. So just in um, developing a portfolio, um, uh, an appropriate portfolio should bring that value of that 1% per year that you're paying to the advisor. By the way, on average, brokers earn from their clients 3% per year. You just, it's hard to figure it out. So uh, what you're paying a broker, it's not up front. And as Megan once said on the program last week, she basically says, if your advisor can't tell you how they're paid in two sentences, then they're not, a, they're not the appropriate advisor for you. Yeah. So a big part of going back to our little charts is the things that matter, the things you can control, and the sweet spot is right in between, which is that's what we should focus on and really look at is where those two intersect. Because now we have some semblance of an ability to affect what we're doing or where we're going. It's a good time, lifetime philosophy as well. Absolutely. So right. let's see if I've done this correctly, then we ought to be able to do this and... Now before you sold all that stuff that we just described in 166, $600 million of Timberwolf securities is what you sold. Before you sold them, this is what your sales team were telling to each other. Got it? 105? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Look what your sales team was saying about Timberwolf. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. Mr. They sold that Mr. shitty Chairman, deal. This email was from the head of the division, not the sales force. This Whatever was it was, it was a, it's, a th internal, th it's an internal Goldman document. This was an email to me in late June. Right. And you sold Timberwolf. Transaction. No, no. You sold Timberwolf after as well. We did trades after that. Yeah. Okay. It's and the trades after. Some you, context. Yeah. Might be helpful. The context, let me tell you, the context is mighty clear. June 22 is the date of this email. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. How much of that shitty deal? did you sell to your clients after June 22, 2007? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know the answer to that, but the price would have reflected levels that they wanted to invest in. Oh, of course, they, but they don't know what's says. You didn't tell them you thought it was a shitty deal. Well, I, I didn't say that. No, who did? Your people, internally. You knew it was a shitty deal, and that's what your and again, e email I, shows. I, I think the context, the message that I took from the email from Mr. Montag, was that my performance on that deal wasn't good. 
And I think the, the fact that we had lost money related to that wasn't good. How about the fact that you sold hundreds of millions of that deal after your people knew it was a shitty deal? Does that bother you at all? You sold a customer something? I, I don't recall selling hundreds of millions of that deal after that. All right, if, let's, let's take a look. Exhibit 166, series of emails. The first is June 26, 07. That's after June 22. July 1, 2007, tells the sales force the top priority is Timberwolf. Your top priority to sell is that shitty deal. Mr. Got it? My comment was I didn't recall the sales. The you got it? One, six. trying to sell. Okay, you're trying to sell a shitty deal, and it's your top priority. Come on, Mr. Sparks. Well, Mr. Chairman. Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell, and by the way, it sold it, a lot of it after that date, should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell a shitty deal? Well, can you answer again, that one? Can words, you answer that one, yes or no? There are. Yep. It's, uh, it's a, uh, a Timberwolf is a, is a limited partnership uh, that uh, Goldman Sachs put together. And Goldman Sachs, by the way, is the gold standard in the industry. But it's also to defend the person on the stand, uh, they're brokers. They're, uh, that's what brokers do. It's kind of like if you don't win in Vegas, uh, are you blaming Vegas? Uh, you know, they, uh, Vegas is just, a, is, as they say, interested in the juice. The, they, are not, they want you to have activity and bet. So, the brokerage firm is basically the same way. They had this deal on the shelf, and when they say sales force, they're talking about financial advisors, the registered in uh, 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 registered investment um, uh, advisors uh, who are working for Goldman Sachs. It's very similar to what happened in uh, here in Orange County. Uh, Orange County, Merrill Lynch. With the had, derivatives. Yeah, they, they sold derivatives uh, to um, the Orange County Treasurer uh, without really explaining the level of risk that was involved because it was labeled fixed income. And he was limited to fixed income investing. And he was known in the community as getting the best return on fixed income. When, when they sold this package to the Orange County Treasurer, the two individuals that were responsible for that went around Merrill Lynch and created videos, had uh, uh, sales meetings. This is how you sell. And when you have a product on their shelf and you're a broker, you got to move it because you can't make any money if it doesn't move. So uh, it's the same thing with, um, and it, this is not the rule yet, but many times brokerage firms have uh, sales contests. And these sales contests, you have, you're required to sell a certain amount of product. And um, else you don't go to your trip to Hawaii. Now, from my point of view, if somebody's involved in a sales contest, they should disclose that to the client that, hey, this will help me out in my sales contest so that the client knows. Right now, that's not the rule. So just be careful when you have a broker. Look for a fiduciary. Thank you, Don, for putting that out. <laughs> Perfect timing. And the other Man, part of it- wonderful. And there's so we had said at the beginning, so Megan's email is Megan at Oak Street Advisory. There's her phone number. So she did a great job with it. It was just timing wise. We couldn't have her come back and do this with us again. But that's why we wanted to use her material and give her credit yeah. for what all was there. So, yes. So, uh, Megan, if you ever watch this, thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm going to take us out of the share. So, Pete, it's been a delightful eight weeks. Um, we will see where we go in the future with these, but I think it's been very good and we've We've had a lot of good participation and a lot of involvement. So yeah. thank you, Don. I really appreciate all your support.
very welcome. I'm going to turn off the recording so we can stop being nice to each other. <laughs>